Hi, sorry, I was uh, looking at a text message. These days, the text messages that come about campaign and about elections quite interesting. Have you seen the one that circulated today which said, the new patriotic party is accusing Madame Charlotte Ose of actually changing the gender of the elephant on their logo that they, they are used to a male elephant. This time it's a female elephant. Have you seen that? That's quite interesting. It makes me happy when I see these things because it means that the politics is not getting to us and we are not going to tear each other apart. Hopefully things will be fine. On Sunday morning there was an event, an incident around in front of, within the vicinity of the flag bearer of the new patriotic party, Nana Kufuado. Uh, some, somewhat settled right now, but you've also seen the letters from the American and British embassies almost similarly worded. We'll talk about that another time. We are taking uh, some time as part of this political Good Evening Ghana to look at some of the institutions of government. Um, so we have spent time with the uh, Ghana Ports and Harbors Authorities. I hope you remember that program where we went to Takradi and all of that. Uh, tonight, we are bringing you um, a coverage of the time that we spent at the Tema oil refinery looking at how the oil refinery is working. We did that because the NDC had been announcing, including in Parliament, that for the first time the oil refinery is working. So we went there to ascertain this for ourselves. We spoke to uh, Mr. Kwame Iwadak, who is the managing director of the Tema oil refinery. We also had a political conversation, and if you hear him on, on politics and economics, he says that the a period of 2001 to 2009 when Ghana obtained a HIPIC initiative, was actually squandered by the MPP. He said that in defense of the infrastructure development of President Mahama. And he also recorded what looks like um, a strong statement for Mr. Mahama's uh, campaign. He also used biblical quotations to indicate that the NDC, his party, will win the elections. After the break, we will show you the interview with Kwame Iwada, who is now 15 minutes past the top of the hour. Tell your friend to tell his friend that you must watch this interview. Very engaging. Very, very engaging. After the break. For the first time, in the last 16 years, the entire petroleum infrastructure of Ghana is working. The Temo oil refinery is back, BOST is back, supporting the country with stocks. Our river barges are transferring petroleum upstream, upcountry. Ghana has come to the place where it is able to meet the vision of the founding president of the country, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. My name is Kwame Iwadakon. I support John Mahama. Vote for John Mahama. He is the safest pair of hands to steer the affairs of state for a bright future and for the destiny of the next generation of Ghanaians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kwame Iwadako. Good evening, Paul. Let me take you back four years ago and start with a political question. Okay. The 31,000 people who voted for you in Iowa, so where's we going? We're hoping to have you back on the ballot so that maybe this time they could push you beyond Ejako, your opponent, who is still on the ballot at this time. But they, they can't find you on the ballot. What happened? Thank you, Paul. I mean, um, it was actually my objective to contest again for the seat. But unfortunately, I'm human, and I can do two things. I can't do three things. Mm -hmm. Having the responsibility for both the bulk oil storage and transportation company and the Tema oil refinery, which are two very critical pieces of our national petroleum supply, meant that I had to give it a pass this time around. But I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those 31,000 people who voted for me and make a direct appeal for them to vote for the gentleman who has replaced me, our current parliamentary candidate, Mr. Delali Kwesi Brimpong. He's a fine gentleman, and NDC is going to produce a really good candidate in him, and I believe he will serve the people of the constituency better than they have been served. So you still have your eyes on the constituency? The, the fact of the matter is, Ayawasu West Wogon constituency is my political birthplace. I will never be able to forget them, and I'll never be able to leave them behind. They are the reason why I am probably where I am today, and I, I have a very, very soft spot in my heart for that constituency. I mean, I've lived there now for about 35 years. I grew up there. I've seen the whole constituency develop, and my mother still lives there. I still live there. A number of my siblings still live there. 
it's a fantastic place. It has a university, it has fantastic learning opportunities. It's a very diverse background. You have very wealthy people, you have some not so very wealthy people. And we all live together in harmony. It's a community before it became a constituency. Mm. And I'm really, really um, appreciative of having had the opportunity to contest on the ticket of the National Democratic Congress. Um, to Is win. that where you cast your ballot? Yes, that's where I cast my ballot. Mm. If you have just joined us, you are watching a very special edition of Good Evening Ghana. It's coming to you from the Tema Oil Refinery here in Accra, Ghana. Well, I should say here in Tema. Uh, one of the favorite towns of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah uh, here in Tema. The refinery has started working again, and uh, you have already seen oil being uh, crude being refined here. Uh, Mr. Wadako, from the 4th of February, or since the 4th of February, the NDC government has been very proud of a particular achievement, that the oil refinery is working again. Yes. They have announced that. Working profitably, by the way. Working profitably. Yes, not some just Some people working. didn't believe it. Uh, some still don't believe it. So tell us a story. Uh, when you arrive, what happened? How is the refinery working again? What does it mean? We were told that the equipment are obsolete. They can never work. It has to be scrapped. It's been there for so long. But you say it's working. Yes. Um, I was given additional responsibility for the Tema oil refinery in July 2015. And this was after having been at uh, the helm of affairs at the Bulk Oil Storage and Transportation Company since October 2013. And what a lot of people don't appreciate, and I just need to uh, go a couple of steps back, is the transition from Bost to Tor was actually the third leg in a five-point plan that His Excellency the President and the Minister for Petroleum uh, put together, and we all sat down and have been working on that agenda. The first thing that we realized was that the Ghana petroleum system was very anemic. Mm -hmm. We're relying on imports, we were having problems with um, a regulated pricing regime, which had led to huge subsidies uh, sitting on the government books that were distorting the fiscal uh, economy and so on and so forth. So the idea was to move from a situation where the bulk oil storage and transportation company could restore its operations as the first step. Once BOST had restored its operations, the second step is BOST would be able to hold enough stocks to keep an active petroleum system enabling the government to implement the price deregulation regime. That took place in end of May, early June 2015. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you remember there were all these naysayers who said the prices are going to go up by 17%, the prices are going to go up by 35%. In fact, on the day of deregulation, prices shot up in, the, in a number of oil marketing companies. Shell, Total, uh, and a few other companies had their prices go up by uh, as much as uh, 11 to 15%. Mm -hmm. We have a strategic partnership as BOST with a company called Go Energy, which is the BDC that is owned by Goyle. Mm -hmm. And we put in place enough stocks to keep the prices flat. Within 14 days, the market share of Goyle, because of the price competition, grew from about 13% to 19.5%. And because it became a real market for petroleum products, the other competitors had to react by reducing their prices. And since then, we've had a very active petroleum system where various oil marketing companies are attracting their customers by quoting different prices and trying to endear themselves to the consuming public. Now the third step is what His Excellency the President pressed the button on in July uh, 2015 by asking me to have additional responsibility for the Tema oil refinery. Because mm -hmm. if you look across West Africa, countries whose refineries have collapsed are exactly the countries whose operate in uh, regulated petroleum pricing regimes. Nigeria is a typical example. So once deregulation had been cleared, it now became easy or possible for Tema oil refinery to stand on its feet and compete. Deregulation means that when I am selling petrol, I decide on the price I sell it myself. Absolutely. 
just I can like sell it at any price I just want. Just like when you are selling cement or when you are selling rice or when you are selling sugar, you define the price at which you sell. So you have to compete. Before then, who determined the price? Before then, there was a pricing formula called the Automatic Price Adjustment Formula, which was being managed by the NPA. And so every two weeks, the NPA would go into the formula and announce a price. And that formula was based on uh, the price of Brent uh, crude oil. It was based on um, certain premiums that were being guaranteed to the fuel importers. And it was based on the foreign exchange that was pre projected for the uh, uh, period of which the, commodity, the uh, petroleum commodities were being sold. So right now, everyone determines their price. Right now, there is no automatic price adjustment formula. You import your petroleum product and you put your price at mm -hmm. wherever you feel comfortable to be able to sell it. So we are all competing for the Ghanaian And that is consumer. driving prices down? Absolutely. If you look at just the last uh, two weeks, there was an announcement that prices were going to go up by 11% and 15%. And indeed, I myself checked it out. We had a situation where Shell was at 3 CDs 74 pesos per liter. Per liter. Total was at 3 CDs 75 pesos per liter of gasoline. Goil was at 3 CDs, uh, uh, 3 point, 3 CDs 63 pesos. Within three days, and even I can confirm when I was driving here, both Total and both uh, and, and, and Shell have dropped their prices down to three CDs, 69 pesos, and so on and so forth. Mm. Because you have to compete. You can't just, you're not relying anymore on a government setting a price. You now have to find a way to make money within market conditions. Mm. So the way in which you source your petroleum products, the way in which you negotiate for your pricing, from your suppliers, the way in which you distribute it, making sure that you're minimizing losses along the distribution supply chain have all become very important. And also, what has become very important is the quality of the fuels. Mm. Now anybody, any taxi driver you talk to, and you know taxi drivers buy from Goyle. Mm. They buy from Goyle because the, the, the gasoline that Goyle sells, which is made in Ghana, very proudly made by the Tema Oil Refinery, is heavier and therefore lasts longer. Mm, I see. So all that is deregulation and the kinds of things that occurred at Bost yeah. in terms of guaranteeing stock. Yes, but I've talked petroleum. about a five-point plan. Yes. The third step was now you've deregulated, it allows a refinery to look at operating in a market competitively because there are no subsidies, you're not going to go back to the government for forex losses or under recoveries. It's a, it's a situation where you have to plan, you have to produce, and you have to be competitive. But when you arrive, were the machines working there? What, how, what do you call those machines? <laughs> well, the, 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 the Tamoy refinery is a complex refinery, so we have two main uh, processes that are actually working today. We have a crude distillation unit, mm -hmm. which is acronym is the CDU, mm -hmm. which is the first primary level of production where you're able to get your gas oil, a little bit of LPG, uh, some uh, naphtha and gasoline and um, um, aviation turbine kerosene or ATK, which is used for aircraft. And then at the end of the day, you will have something called atmospheric residue, which is the secondary processing, which goes into the RFCC, which is the residue fluid catalytic cracker. Mm -hmm. But we call it the RFCC. Mm -hmm. So that also does a secondary processing and further extracts more gasoline, more naphtha, more LPG um, out of the bottoms of that. And then at the end of that process, you're going to end up with uh, cracked fuel oil, which is also a valuable product. Were, they, were these machines working, these equipment, were they working? They needed some basic maintenance. So we did a number of things because we didn't just come and turn on the machines. All the machines and everything you see there is driven by people. And one of the philosophies I've had in my management and even in my politics is you need to focus on the people. Because if you solve the people problems, you've solved about 80% of the problems. The remaining 20, the people will solve it themselves for you. So we, put, uh, we broke the entire organization up into a number of syndicates. We stripped the business model apart. 
and we asked ourselves, what have we done wrong and what can we do better? And the first thing we recognize is that Temo Oil Refinery is not just a refinery. There are a number of additional business units in. Mm -hmm. So we have a refinery business which is running today. We have a storage business which is also running where we have a big terminal. Tor has more t uh, tank storage tanks than the entire bus put together. Um, so the terminal business in Tor is quite large. That's a storage. Yes. Okay. And then we have a transmission business where we receive, we move petroleum products into the country within the refinery and also across the country by our alliance with, with um, um, BOST. And then we also have a fuel trading business. Now, that was a very fundamental uh, uh, restructuring of the mindset in the organization. Because all of a sudden, the refinery team sat down and says, we have a business to run. We've got to be able to convert or process crude oil into refined products profitably. The storage uh, or the terminal uh, part of the business recognized that we have a business to run. We're receiving petroleum products from the refinery. We are receiving petroleum products from third party uh, customers. And we've got to handle their products and deliver their products to them on quality, on spec, on time. That's another source of revenue uh, for the company. Um, the government has recently uh, uh, given Tamar Refinery a concession, a 15-year concession on the offshore mooring facilities, which is comprising of uh, uh, a, a CBM, a Cowboy mooring system, and an SPM, a single point mooring system, which is basically the receiving, petroleum receiving facilities for the country. Um, that's another business that TOR is engaged in, and that's also um, quite a lucrative uh, business. So we had all of these businesses, and then we layered over it. Because once you have infrastructure, you can trade. So we layered over it in partnership with BOST, the trading aspect of the business. Now, because BOST had established itself in the market, both on the importation of refined products and also on the sale and, well, the supply of uh, petroleum products to the Ghana market, as well as holding a strategic storage for the country. We came to an agreement between BOST and TOR, where BOST now supplies crude oil to Temoro Refinery. The refinery business in Temoro Refinery refines it and charges a tolling fee. Mm. So for example, to date, I'd say about 5.5 5 million barrels of crude have been refined and TOR has earned earns $5.5 .5 a barrel, and so TOR's income today is in, the, is in the region of $27 million, without taking any commercial risk on the exposure $5 million of per what? Per any, $5.5 .5 million a barrel. Mm -hmm. We've processed $5 million uh, uh, barrels, and therefore TOR has earned in excess of $27 million. Did you invest any money to get the equipment working again? Yes, we did, but we didn't invest large sums of money. We got the maintenance team in Temoyo Refinery to sit around the table and decide what needed to be done. The major challenges the refinery actually have what has to do with our boilers. And on the RFCC, some of the equipment which had been installed um, since inception hadn't been changed and hadn't gone through a critical maintenance program. But effectively, we achieved this without any foreign uh, expertise. It was all homegrown Temo oil refinery engineers who put it together. And I remember um, all local based engineers. Local, tall, grown, homegrown, trained, developed. Tall staff engineers. Tall staff engineers, KNUST um, engineers, and so on and so forth. Ghanaian, born and bred, raised, trained. And they were able to do it. And, and even more. Mm, I see. Yeah. Later tonight in this interview, um, Mr. Wadak will be taking political questions. We'll be asking him about the economic comparison between the eight years of President Kufo and the eight years, uh, the NDC period, especially the President Mahama period. We'll also uh, talk to him about the infrastructure that the NDC is using as a punchline for their campaign, what he thinks about it. And uh, we'll find out from him whether he thinks President Mahama will be re-elected. So that's the politics that's coming up um, in a minute as part of this interview. For the first time in the last 16 years, the entire petroleum infrastructure of Ghana is working. The Temo Oil Refinery is back, 
bust his back supporting the country with stocks. Our river barges are transferring petroleum upstream, up country. Ghana has come to the place where it is able to meet the vision of the founding president of the country, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. My name is Kwame Iwadakon. I support John Mahama. Vote for John Mahama. He is the safest pair of hands to steer the affairs of state for a bright future and for the destiny of the next generation of Ghanaians. Thank you. Everything you've said is great. Yep. I think if I'm a banker, I will understand it. Yep. I think that if I'm a petroleum engineer, I'll understand it. Yep. But let's take it down to the people. Yep. So there's a guy in Amakomi in Kumasi who sells yams uh, on a truck. And he's watching this program and he's about to tune off. But what does all that mean? Yeah. What, what does all what has happened at all mean for somebody like that? Very good. And I'll take it on two levels. Mm. And I like the example of the taxi driver or the yam seller. Mm. So you have the bulk movement of foodstuffs from farming communities into urban centers. That business is driven by diesel. Diesel. Gas oil. Yes, they're all trucks. And they're all diesel trucks. Mm. And then you have people driving to the market centers to buy foodstuffs to take home. That's driven by petrol, because that's the individual movements and mm. stuff. So effectively, the connection between what we are doing here and what the average Ghanaian is uh, 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 using every day for their lifestyle is based on the cost of gas oil or diesel or the cost of gasoline or petrol. Because gas oil is the big trucks that go into the market centers. You see them loaded with oranges. You see them loaded with yams. You see them loaded with charcoal. All of that transportation is based on diesel. So what should the guy be excited about? The guy should be excited about a couple of things. Mm. First of all, the President Mahama administration, by price deregulation, has been able to effectively reduce the cost to the consumer of the movement of these products because everybody is competing versus an automatic price adjustment formula. And the critical part of it is very simple. When we moved into the deregulation uh, environment, we did a comparison between the automatic price adjustment formula prices, which would have been in effect if we hadn't deregulated, and the actual prices in the, uh, in the uh, deregulated regime. Paul, the figures were outstanding. So effectively, there was a differential of one CD, 50 pesos per liter. Mm -hmm. And in that period, June 2015 to June 2016, mm -hmm. we consumed 4.4 billion liters. So the savings to the uh, uh, Ghanaian economy was in excess of 5 billion CDs or $1.2 billion. So, if you've been able to take out a cost of $1.2 billion, distributed over 27, 28 million people, it makes a lot of difference because it's that three CDs per person, that 20 CDs per person for that trip or that journey that has been saved. Plus, it's dollars Ghana did not have to find to go and repatriate externally. Which brings me to the second part of the equation. When you import refined products, effectively you're exporting jobs. Because somebody's refinery in somebody's country, somebody's shipping vessel, none of which are Ghanaian, are utilized in the, in the processing of the crude oil into refined products, the shipping and the distribution or the landing in Ghana. You've exported jobs, you've helped somebody's economy. And we all know that when you don't have a, a good industrial base, your job security as a country is pretty tough. So the second leg of this equation, which, which means a lot to me personally as a Ghanaian, and I'm sure to all the workers we have in the Temoro refinery and their dependents, and I mean, we are employing close to a thousand people. And if each person has dependents and the other businesses that are supplying us food, there are people who are uh, selling into the refinery. We're talking about 
12 to 15 uh, people per employee here. So we are really talking about their, their wards, their families, their extended family. We're talking about people who supply us with food. We're talking about people who supply the refinery with medical facilities and so on and so, services and so on and so forth. So if you have the ability to preserve a thousand jobs, it actually adds a multiplier effect of about 12,000 jobs. And these 12,000 jobs are also further on enhancing economic activity and generation. So having a refinery up and running is one of the most critical factors we've had. And in addition to that, we've generated fuel security for the country. Now if you go to any serious country in the world, strategic stocks are never held in refined products. Strategic stocks are actually held in crude oil. Mm -hmm. And when there's a disruption in the global system, they just run the crude. Because you can store crude for 100 years. For refined products, you can only store them for 90 days, and then you have to refresh. And so the relationship between BOST and the refinery has been a very, very So we are storing one. our strategic stock now as crude. We have a mix. We have always in stock a million barrels of crude oil as strategic stock, which we refresh by bringing in um, additional crude, and then we also have refined products that we hold in stock. We used to hear all the time that a government takes over and they have four weeks of guaranteed crude, two weeks. So how much do we have? I mean, at the moment, and it's very interesting you've asked that question, but at the moment, we have about two million barrels in country in the refinery. And we're actually discharging one crude How vessel. long is that? How long will it take to consume that? One of that? the major things that we are about to do is double the capacity of the refinery. In fact, next week, we would have finished commissioning a second furnace for the CDU. And we're going to go from processing a million barrels in 44 days to a million barrels in 22 days. That means that we're going to be able to cover close to 65% of national consumption as a refinery. And I think that's very, very so positive. So we're going to import less? No, we're going to process more within so that a shorter period. So percent of what we consume would have been processed here. That's the point. Yes. But, and that's a very sensitive issue, there has to be a policy decision made by the government to restrict our imports vis-a-vis -vis the balance of our production. Mm. Let me take you on one matter that has always been talked about. Yes. $550 million debt for yes. TOR. Yes. Uh, if you haven't paid this debt, or you have not been able to pay this debt, or you don't have a plan, a workable plan to pay this debt, because TOR debt has been part of the national budget conversation for a long time. For a very, very long time. Since Rawlings, Kofu, Mills. And I, I, we, do we still have a TOR debt? It's still we still have a TOR debt. And again, this is why I think His Excellency President Mahama has been extremely courageous. When you have subsidies, uh, in your petroleum pricing sector, you are always going to be accumulating debt because people are not going to be able to sell petroleum products at the market prices and the government has to find a way to subsidize it. So the major step of price deregulation has drawn a line under subsidies and under tort debt recovery. However, there's a legacy debt. And that legacy debt, we've been successful in renegotiating into a 10-year bond, $261 million worth of, with four banks, uh, led by Echo Bank, Access Bank, GT Bank, and UT Bank. So that's half of the debt restructured. We're in talks with two, uh, three other parties, and we're going to use the first model to mirror onto the second model. Now, I have to give a special credit here to the Petroleum Minister and the Finance Minister who helped put this structure together. I believe you are aware there was an act that was passed by the parliament called the Energy Services Levies Act, mm. which is to take out all the legacy debt that has been accumulated in both the petroleum So, so and over the, the next 10 years, we'll continue to pay the TOR debt? You said 10-year bond? That's the maximum, because mm. TOR is going to make enough money out of its own operating cash flow to reduce the time frame within which Mm. Uh, that money needs to be paid. And we have uh, an accelerated payment clause in the bond. The MPP spent quite a bit of time on their manifesto to talk about the energy sector, and yes. uh, they are not particularly happy with a lot of things going on here. Um, they say, for instance, and you had been accused of that even before the MPP came in, that you, Kwame Wadako, have squeezed out the private sector of the petroleum sector 
the private sector was quite sufficiently lucrative. They employed a lot of people. The BDC today is not, not as much as we did. Not as much as the. But why do you squeeze reports. out the private sector? Well, the truth of the matter is, I am a private. You, you don't sector. like the BDCs, Paul. I'm a private sector person. That is my background, mm. and that was the reason why His Excellency the President decided to bring a person with a private sector background to lift up our state institutions. There is, look, BOST and TOR today are run on a private sector mentality. So the truth of the matter is BDCs, as you're describing, and everybody else in this space has to compete. TOR has to compete. BOST has to compete. We're not asking for monopolies. The reality is that competition is good because the consumer benefits. What has happened is that historically, our BDCs were operating in a regulated market. Your profits were guaranteed because the NPA in the automatic price adjustment formula guaranteed a premium for BDCs. Your forex losses were guaranteed, which is unheard of anywhere in the world because, I mean, I have friends who are in the private sector in Ghana who are importing rice and sugar. Nobody guarantees a foreign exchange for them. If the foreign exchange moves against them, they absolutely have to find a way to recover. So the BDC system that was being run wasn't engendering high level of competitiveness in the industry. The only thing that they had to compete for was market share. Because at the end of the but day... But you have collapsed them now. Where are they? You've collapsed them. They are not collapsed. We have a number of very active BDCs. In fact, BOST today is not doing more than 25% of the supplies of petroleum products in the country. And we are doing that at the same time holding a strategic stock, which gives the country comfort and a buffer. So we have so much stock, we are able to um, export our products to Niger, to Mali, to Burkina Faso, to Nigeria, to Benin, to Ivory Coast. So we are not utilizing our stock position to affect the local market because we have the infrastructure to export these products as well. So it gives us a good turnover, and it allows us to diversify our risk from a single country like Ghana. So for us, it's about competition. And look, what is the difference between a state-owned enterprise and a private sector company? Because both are enterprises. Both have, a, uh, both have shareholders who expect a decent return on their investment. I mean, the people of Ghana have invested in Tema Oil Refinery. They, des they deserve a decent uh, return on their investment. They don't want to be paying TOR debt recovery levy in perpetuity. They also, at some point in time, want TOR to come and say, this is a dividend check we've supplied, we've produced, we've processed, and we've made a profit for the people of Ghana. When Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, was envisaging and building the Tamara refinery, he had no sense of making losses. He had two issues in mind. One was fuel security for the country, and two was to build a petrochemical hub in, in, in West Africa to create jobs for the people of Ghana. And Paul, today this is where we are. Tor is um, back in production. As I said, when we started on the 4th of February, the plan was to do 3 million barrels because the refinery hadn't been run for a while. I wanted to know what weaknesses existed in the setup so we could plan for our turnaround maintenance. We wanted to do between 1 and 3 million. We were able to process 3 million. We noticed some weaknesses. We shut down um, for about a month and a half or so. We are back up on stream. And we are processing now a million barrels every uh, 22 days from next week. The best news that I have, Paul, is that on the 22nd of November, TOR is going to take delivery of its first parcel of indigenous crude. We've bought a million barrels, well, BOST has bought a million barrels of 10 crude from uh, the, the second FPSO at Mills. It's going to come in here and we are going to refine products and we are going to sell to the Ghanaian market. Now why this is very exciting is because this is the vision of the founding father of the country. And if you read the speech Kwame Nkrumah delivered, he was so visionary. He was able to say that in one day... But he, did, he didn't know that we have oil. He said in one day, when Ghana has its own crude oil, it will be brought to this refinery and it will be refined here. Oh, he said that? He did say that in his, in his inauguration speech. And that is going to happen this November. Mm, I see. After a long time, though. 
after a long time, but that is what vision is about. And what I always keep telling people is that visionaries have one major challenge. But, but let me get it clear. I, I need to make this point, Paul. Mm. Visionaries have one major challenge. They live in tomorrow. So they think ahead for people, and unfortunately for them, most of us live in today. And this is where we let our visionary leaders down, and we're not able to stay the course with them, and our development as a country has been cut back. And I think for, the, for, a, 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 for a long time now, we also have a very visionary president, His Excellency President Mahama, who has made massive infrastructure investments for the future of this country, because he's looking at tomorrow. We, we talk about infrastructure because some people say that if people are poor, infrastructure means nothing to them. We'll come to that. We'll come to so that. the point, you are, the achievements that you talked about is that Tor is buying crude oil from the 10 fields in Ghana. Correct. And refine it in Ghana. So they are Correct. not going to export it and, and then we go and buy refined products. Yes. We are, we are starting that on the 22nd of November, you said? Yes. We have in a, 2016? 2016. Okay. Um, it's actually uh, in the MPP manifesto, but unfortunately for them, we've already achieved it. Oh, it's in their manifesto? It's in their manifesto to process indigenous crude. But His Excellency President Mahama is already doing that. All what you are saying is well and good. Uh, and you talk about the MPP manifesto. Uh, the MPP has been alleging corruption against the Mahama government in general. But with the petroleum sector, they have alleged that the things you're doing are at very high cost. The restructuring of Bost, the, the trucks that take the, the crude, there's partisan interest in it, uh, and there's uh, a lot of corruption around the things that you're uh, doing. I mean, it's, it's, it, it makes no sense to, to say that. But first of all, when you are competing, you can't have corruption. It's impossible. I mean, if you have to buy, process, and sell, and make a profit to be able to pay back, where is there going to be any corruption? It doesn't exist. You know, Paul, it's easy to sit back and say somebody is alleged corruption, but in the petroleum sector today, as we have in Ghana, I can tell you with the, what I have seen before, I came in, what I see and I know now, we have probably one of the cleanest and the most efficient petroleum systems in West Africa. In fact, I just came back from Abuja today, we were invited by the NNPC to to discuss with them how we've been able to put um, Ghana's petroleum system back on track and to share ideas as to how we can collaborate and make the West African petroleum sector more indigenous. So if we were doing things that were not professional, if we were doing things that were not were improper, there is absolutely no way we would have been able to sustain our process. I mean, you know, we started uh, petroleum imports as BOST without the traditional going to the bank to borrow money to establish letters of credit. BOST has been importing petroleum products since February 2015 on its own without going to any banks to establish letters of credit on the basis of the credibility of the company, the management, the staff, the government. Um, there's no government guarantee. It's just because we've put in transparent processes and systems. So we've gone from having $30 million open account uh, suppliers credit to close to a billion dollars today. And we're working with international companies that are heavily regulated. We're not working with one part player. We're working with about seven or eight. They all compete for our business because we have to compete for the Ghanaian consumer's business. Mm. So if our prices are not good... So the corruption allegation is ridiculous, that's what you're saying? The corruption allegations are unfounded. Mm. You're talking about infrastructure, and there. There's, a, there's a big matter for this campaign. Mm -hmm. NDC says we've done the infrastructure. MPP says we also did infrastructure. In fact, they said that in terms of interchange, they did eight, you are doing, you are talking about two. Uh, President Mahama yeah. has been hitting the infrastructure button. The fundamental question uh, that Ghanaians are hearing from the MPP is, if you are hungry, if you can't pay school fees, if you, if you can't attend the hospital because NHS collapsed, what does a road mean to you? What does the school building mean to you if you can't go there? Good, Paul. Again, you have to look at a country and you have to understand that we are in the business of development. And development is hard work. And we are in a competitive regional environment. Now, if you are able to bring efficiency into the economy, it ends up putting money in people's pockets. So if you have a good road, 
you're able to deliver food from the farm gate to the market center without the driver having to spend more time on the road, without the driver having to um, um, spend a lot of fuel and spare parts and so on and so forth. You come to this thing of one district, one factory. If President Mahama didn't have the vision of building roads, sending electricity, putting in hospitals, putting in schools, what factory can you build there? Because you're going to need for that factory educated people, you're going to need hospitals to look after them, you're going to need roads to carry their goods to and fro, you're going to need electricity. So the reality is that infrastructure is the foundation. I mean, I was speaking in Kumasi over the weekend. Why do people go abroad? Because of infrastructure. I mean, we actually know some people go abroad, you know, to take care of their health because of the infrastructure over there. But it's not everybody who can go outside of the country. So we believe as a government that we need to bring infrastructure to the people of Ghana at their doorsteps, not 2,000 miles away where the average Ghanaian can't afford it. The NDC is a mass party. We think of the people, we work for the people, we serve the people. Yes, what, yes, and we what? will continue to do so utilizing infrastructure as an ex tool for accelerated development and we'll continue to do so by bringing uh, the people of Ghana together and mobilizing our hearts and our minds on the path of development, on the path of divisiveness. Here's the, the catch. So the MPP say that. They also did infrastructure and they put money in the people's pocket. They obtained a hippic uh, forgiveness and they put money in the people's pocket. You are doing infrastructure, they are accusing you that you're not putting money in the people's pocket in spite of all the loans. Paul, you've asked a very good question. And I've studied this at great length because I actually came into politics to make a difference. The economic miracle of the eight years of NPP could not sustain itself. That means it was an inflated one. And I'll give you an example. HIPIC brought in a lot of money into the country because we didn't have to spend money servicing debts. The HIPIC money that came into the country was treated in one fundamental, uh, with one fundamental mistake. The money was not invested into infrastructure or into the productive side of the economy. The money was invested in the consumption side of the economy. So there was a false wealth that was created. And I'll explain it to you. You had a situation where the economy was moved from 11 billion to 40 billion. But it was done without any factories. It was done without any agricultural base. It was done based on imports. So what happened was there was a lot of money in the system. Credit was loose and cheap. So Ghanaians were importing everything. So you could get a loan to buy a fridge, you could get a loan to buy a deep freezer, and it gave people a false sense of prosperity. So when the money ran out, you had gone from an 11 billion CD economy to a 40 billion CD economy, which was based on imports. So guess what? The currency started falling. And one of the things that a lot of uh, 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 voters, one of the mistakes a lot of voters make is that the decisions of a political party necessarily happen after a certain period of time. So a decision that was made in 2000, you will start seeing the effects of that decision in 2007, 2008. Because if all that, if even 20 billion of that uh, 30 billion addition to the economy had been put into roads, had been put into factories. But, but they did. They did eight interchanges. Accra Kumasi Road. Paul, they didn't finish them. But eight interchanges. They, they did not finish them. And they say they did hippic schools, the schools that they wrote, hippic schools. <sighs> Those were not new schools. Those Cocoa were, production rose up to a million tons. Cocoa production is up to today. We still have cocoa production at a very high level. Now, you see, the other thing about cocoa production is that the growth doesn't happen. You don't plant cocoa on Monday, and 12 months later, you harvest cocoa at a high level. So you look at the, the seedlings that we are distributing as a party within the cocoa growing areas. His Excellency, the President just announced last week, cut your old cocoa trees down and plant new cocoa trees. And by the way, we are giving them to you free. It's going to take three years for those cocoa trees to start bearing fruit, mm. the new ones. And it's only after five years that they'll start optimizing. So somebody will come into power 
uh, five years from now and try to take credit for something that President so Mahama did. So blew the hippie opportunity? They blew it. Because on bad policies? On, on bad policies. Because it was a false economy. Now, if it's a real economy, it will sustain itself. That's the difference. Because you can't fool the market. If the incomes that people were earning were real, based on production, not based on imports, because any time you import, you export jobs. So the minute you now have a big job problem, is because um, from 2000 to 2008, we're not able to use the revenues that accrue to the country in the form of HIPIC on creating jobs. Okay, but they handed over to you a lighted country and the buoy down. And uh, I mean, we are oh, just coming from oh. a very devastating <laughs> Doomsaw situation. We don't even know whether we're actually out. Well, I think Doomsaw is over. The president said he'll fix it. He has fixed it. But the buoy dam, and I'm going to be very blunt here, I'm sorry, but the NDC has not been honest to Ghanaians about the impact of the buoy dam. And it's very simple. In a rule of thumb, $1 million is equal to one megawatt. So anytime you make an investment of a million dollars, you should be able to add one megawatt generation capacity to the country. Mm -hmm. Buidam cost us $600 million. Mm -hmm. It has an installed capacity of about 290 to 300 megawatts. But available capacity is less than 100 megawatts. Mm -hmm. So that single policy cost the country, you and I, taxpayers' money, $600 million, and it only gives us 90 megawatts because the engineering was bad. The reservoir behind the buoy dam, which is the water that is able to accumulate, is a very small reservoir. Unlike Akosombo, which stretches from Akosombo, which is the southern part of the country, all the way up to Burkina Faso, which is a very large reservoir, buoy is a really small reservoir, which means that you can only run it for peaking periods which is in the evening, and you can only generate 90 megawatts. Now you imagine that that $600 million had been used to invest into thermal plants. We would have 600 megawatts. There would be no need for emergency power today. So an opportunity that we had between 2000 and 2008 was squandered. And poor President Mahama, being the gentleman that he is, says, I will take responsibility for it. The reality that Ghanaians need to know is the seeds of this current power crisis is a, wrong, is a result of wrong investment and underinvestment into the power sector between 2000 and 2008. But it's okay, we fixed it. And we'll continue to improve the country for the benefit of the people of Ghana. This is Good Evening Ghana. I'll be back after the break. You have been listening to Kwame Wada, MD of Tor, MD of Bost. For the first time in the last 16 years, the entire petroleum infrastructure of Ghana is working. The thermal oil refinery is back, BOST is back, supporting the country with stocks. Our river barges are transferring petroleum upstream, up country. Ghana has come to the place where it is able to meet the vision of the founding president of the country, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. My name is Kwame Iwadakun. I support John Mahama. Vote for John Mahama. He is the safest pair of hands to steer the affairs of state for a bright future and for the destiny of the next generation of Ghanaians. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we have changed location just to give you a feel of the vision of the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. So tell us, where, where are we? What's behind us? We are in the heart mm. of uh, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's industrial vision for Ghana. Mm. Behind us is the Tema port. On the right to me is the Volta Aluminium Company, Valco. Um, you have the steel smelters mm. uh, further down. And this is the Tema oil refinery. Mm. Amazing. It's a beautiful shot in the night. I see the lights are on, sort of. Yeah. Okay. So I was, I was going to, to remind you that maybe Doomsaw is not over, but I think the lights are on. Uh, so the car the, power ship is in the background working. Oh, the car power. Producing 225 megawatts for the Republic of Ghana. What feeling do you get from the staff? And I'm asking this based on this is your concept of 
a private sector attitude in a public sector company. What, yes. what feeling do you get from the 1,000 staff that work here? Okay, I think the 1,000 staff that work here are the greatest asset of this company. But it took some work to turn them into an asset. And there's a parallel that I'll explain to you. I mean, when we came here, the company couldn't pay salaries. We were behind on uh, statutory payments. We, didn't, we hadn't paid SNIT. We didn't, couldn't afford electricity. I mean, there were days when our power was cut off by ECG because Tor couldn't afford to pay the electricity bills. So I got my unions together, and I got my workers together. And I asked them to do a very difficult thing. And I said, we're in a hole. And we're not going to come out of the hole by one person's effort. It's not showmanship or blowmanship. It's a team effort. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to defer or give up a minimum of one month's salary so that the company can use that cash flow to help itself stand up. Some workers gave a month. Some workers gave six weeks. And Paul, this is a very important Christian principle. Anytime you want to do something significant, God asks for a sacrifice. The workers of Tema Oil Refinery paid a price for the success we're seeing today. And that is why after running our 3 million barrels and I was confident and happy, we did a thanksgiving service to God. Because we came together, we got God's blessings, we said, this is our sacrifice to the restoration of this industrial enterprise. Now, traditionally, it's private sector companies where the owners and the management are the ones who make sacrifices to help a company stand up. But we were able to achieve this because the mindset today of the workers of Tamara Refinery is stronger than private enterprise. We have something to prove. We want to show Ghanaians that we are not a tall debt recovery levy. We're a productive, solid part of Ghana's industrial foundation and, and vision so, of... So if any engineer is watching this program in his final year, he wants to get to tour, he wants to come and work at tour, he's, he's headed for the right place? He's headed for the right place. One of the things that we are doing is we are putting together a 100,000 uh, barrel additional part of the refinery. So we're going to be up to 160,000 because by 2018, would have expanded from the 45,000 we're doing today to 60,000. But Paul, I just want to come back to this principle of a sacrifice. You have achieved, you've done something with your life. You've come from somewhere to somewhere. You, you know the price you've paid. And this is part of why you've been able to succeed because you had a vision of where you wanted to go. And this is exactly the point I was trying to make about the president's vision for the country. And you can't achieve anything in life if there isn't an element of a sacrifice. And that price, we have paid it. And that is why today, you see currency is stable. The Ghanaian city is the best performing currency in the end. What has that got to do with tall currency? It has a lot to do with tall because when you see stability, it's not luck. It's people who have sat down planned and taking deliberate steps to execute. So we recognize that between and within the petroleum system, we were leaking close to a billion dollars in subsidies and in uh, forex uh, 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 claims. Mm. So the government again took difficult decisions, deregulated, unpopular decision. Everybody said it would fail, it wouldn't last, but it's a deliberate policy. And as a result of that, what we are doing in tour today, we bring in a million barrels. Out of that million barrels, you're going to get about 20,000 tons of diesel. Uh, 20,000 tons of diesel today is worth something in the range of 22 to 23 million dollars. You're going to get 18,000 tons of gasoline or petrol. That is worth close to about 16, 17 million dollars. We're going to get about 18,000 tons of aviation turbine kerosene or ATK. That is worth close to a 20 million dollars. So on these three products, you've actually paid for your crude oil. Then you have your LPG, which you're going to get about 6,500 tons, which you sell into the local market. And then you now have 
NAFTA, which you export, 25, 30,000 tons of NAFTA today is $12 million. And your cracked fuel, oil, or HFO will give you another 6 to $9 million. So this refinery actually converts $53 million into $61 million every 1 million barrel run. That means that whenever we export, we A, generate foreign exchange for the country, we help stabilize our balance of payments, versus just importing, where you are effectively, when you import, you know what you do, Paul? Mm -hmm. The cocoa farmer who carries on his back, produces those seeds and carries those sacks on his back, gives this economy $1.8 billion. When you import, you are effectively trampling on the back of that cocoa farmer to take his dollars to fund jobs in foreign economies. And this is something that if you don't have a solid infrastructure base, you're not going to be able to have your factories. That means you're not going to be able to bring your jobs here. If you don't have enough power to drive your economy, which is why power is one of the central tenets of President Mahama's uh, efforts in the last few years, he has solved the Dumso problem. You cannot go to the next level. So the currency is stable because you, you don't import? As much. The currency is stable because the balance of payment situation in the country is equalizing because we are processing, we are manufacturing, and we are driving the economy with good fiscal policies. You know, everybody says there's no money in our pockets or we want money. His Excellency, the President, is the Commander in Chief. He has access to the Finance Ministry and so on and so forth. If we want, we didn't want, he didn't want to be prudent with the management of the nation's resources. It's an easy thing for him to flow money into the system, but we will pay a price after that. And that price will be a dislocation of the fiscal. Once your fiscal is stable, your, macro, your macroeconomic environment is stable, then the micro thrives. Because government borrowing is going down, interest rates have started going down, businesses are now going to be able to borrow at low interest rates. And you're going to see this in the next four years of President Mohammed's administration. So this country is on the verge of an economic takeoff based on deliberate, difficult policy decisions that His Excellency the President has driven his cabinet and the government. Will this be a more difficult election than 2012? <laughs> well, that's the easiest question you've asked me. <laughs> Would it be a more difficult election? My honest analysis, mm -hmm. and I am a very, very strong believer in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It has never failed. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I don't even spend my time and effort worrying about the outcome of the 2016 elections is found in Mark chapter 3, verse 25. The Gospel of Mark? Yes. Chapter 3, verse 25. Verse 25. What does it say? <laughs> it says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. This is the word of God. It's not my word. Which house is the, who is divided against what? I'll leave that to the people of Ghana. But any house or any political party that is divided, according to the word of God, cannot stand. Is the NDC not divided? Okay. I am going to leave that to you and your public to decide mm. which po political party in Ghana today. Mark chapter what? 3 verse 25. Hmm. A house divided itself against itself. A house divided against itself cannot stand. In other words, a, a house divided win. against itself cannot win election. It cannot stand. And if you cannot stand, you cannot fight. And if you cannot fight, you cannot win. Hmm. <laughs> but the crowds are similar. Paul. Anaku Fado is pulling some of the amazing crowds, Paul. even in the Volta region. So Mahama is also pulling the, the crowds. Truth, the truth of the matter is that the two main parties in this country, and I'll say the NPP is a large party. Mm -hmm. So they will get crowds, but they cannot cross the 50 plus one. Will you cross? Easily. Easily? Look, I've been around the country, and I'm yeah. doing a lot of work and campaigning in the Ashanti region. Mm. The feedback I'm getting from the ordinary people of Ghana is that the message of His Excellency the President has gotten through. Yes, we've had some difficulties, but we all had to sacrifice for a better future. And they can see it. They can see their schools, they can see their hospitals, they can see that the time it takes for them to move to and fro has been cut down. Now, all of this infrastructure creates jobs. Look at the hospital, for example, in Legon, that is about to be commissioned. That hospital will have staff, 
it will have people who supply amenities to that hospital. It will have people who feed the workers of mm. that hospital. And it everything. will have a whole, I mean, the people manufacturing from pharmaceuticals, their supply base is going to increase. All that is jobs. So the truth of the matter is we are at the place where we are constructively and sustainably going to be dealing with the most critical pro problem this country faces, which is how we get our economy in a productive phase by utilizing the teeming talent, just like the kind I came to meet in Tor, who are capable, who are willing, and who are very success-driven to be able to give ourselves the jobs we need sustainably. And you know, the equation in the world today, we used to talk about independence, independence. The game today in the global system is how to successfully be interdependent. So there are things we do today using our existing infrastructure, which has integrated us into the West African petroleum system. So we are exporting to about six countries in West Africa. They now depend on us. Guess what? We've been complaining historically that Ghana is importing onions from uh, 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 Niger and from Burkina Faso. We are selling refined products to them today. This is trade. This is balance of payments. This is economic activity. Let's come back to Ashanti region because we've also been there. Yeah. And we spoke to um, Mr. Wuntumi. Yes. He calls himself the regional governor <laughs> of Ashanti. He says that he's going to take all the constituencies the NDC have, especially Asamase. And Asamase has been showing some very, very powerful MPP events he, uh, right there. He needs to go and revise his notes because the one million votes is going to be a huge dent into the electoral Will you get the one million? We will. You are confident about that? I am very positive we're going to get the one million. Mm. So from the ninth floor of the Tema oil refinery, <laughs> Kwame Wadaku, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And good luck. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Good night. For the first time in the last 16 years, the entire petroleum infrastructure of Ghana is working. The Tema oil refinery is back, BOST is back, supporting the country with stocks. Our river barges are transferring petroleum upstream, upcountry. Ghana has come to the place where it is able to meet the vision of the founding president of the country, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. My name is Kwame Iwadakun. I support John Mahama, vote for John Mahama. He is the safest pair of hands to steer the affairs of state for a bright future and for the destiny of the next generation of Ghanaians. Thank you.